definitely uh, we are hoping that we can change uh, our uh, the way in which we think we, we could manage disasters that is we respond effectively rather than responding to disasters we want to prevent human disasters so give us an example where uh, have well, people started doing things differently as a result of Nargis uh, uh, this concept of build back better is a better schools better health stations better roads better dikes better dams so that uh, people will be uh, protected and I think it's just like uh, a, a, a matter of attitude a change of mindset uh, just like a fire drill that when you have a fire what you would you do where would be the fire escape disasters in many parts of Southeast Asia and anywhere in the world you have to build in to the psyche of the people that there are ways of avoiding and minimizing the impacts they will come yeah. but I think more important question for for us this panel is to explore the relationship between climate change sustainability uh, development uh, sustainable development and the human impact of this climate change that is going on it's no longer abstract it is happening in front of us every day we are experiencing it uh, so if we want to do sustainable development in a way that would reduce uh, impact negative impact on our climate in the end these human problems will be reduced I think what we are as a global community facing now is as, as the subtitle of this conference is the challenges of humanitarianism in the face of the degradation of our environment and it is happening and we are seeing it every day so and it works and, both yeah, ways doesn't yeah, it yeah, in, um, South, in Southeast Asia if you if you want to go for um, the biofill in order to diversify your source what do you do you push people out into the forest to clear land in order to plant palm oil and that's happening in m many parts of Southeast Asia I won't men mention countries uh, and the impact is you know smog fog and uh, smoke in many many cities in, in, in Southeast Asia and uh, and, and that will bring hazards to the people, to the health of the people. On top of that, it will change climate pattern. On top of that, it will uh, challenge us on how to respond when calamities strikes. All these things are in, in chain. It, it, it's, so a cycle. it's a cycle. Yes. Let's bring in some questions from the audience. Um, Thank you. My name is Salim al Haq. I come originally from Bangladesh, but I'm now based in London with the International Institute for Environment and Development, where I had the climate change program. I'd like to make two uh, comments, if I may, from the climate change side. In, in, I'm also lead author of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change on Adaptation. In the adaptation arena, we are now uh, talking more about uh, adaptation in phases, as it were. The original concept of adaptation was, if you like, adaptation in situ, helping people to continue their livelihoods in the face of climatic impacts where they are. But it's increasingly becoming self-evident that that's not going to be possible everywhere. And there are parts of the world where over the long term, by that, you know, within the next decade or two, people are not going to be able to continue their livelihoods. So within the adaptation scientific arena, we are now talking about a second phase of adaptation, which is one of planned relocation. And I think that's in many ways what you're talking about here with respect to the impacts on migration. What is not happening, though, in the international climate change discussions in the framework convention is this not coming forward. It's very much the traditional concept of adaptation, and it's something that I think countries like Bangladesh, which have already started identifying this, and UN agencies like OCHA might want to bring forward in the Copenhagen discussions to at least put a marker in there to ensure that migration or planned relocation as a form of adaptation is considered and accepted in whatever comes out in Copenhagen, because at the moment it isn't there. Thanks very much, Mr. ol -Huck. A response from the panel? Anyone want to, to that the migration is actually a legitimate form of adaptation? Well, I think it's, I'm not sure it's legitimate, it's just necessary, it's just, it's just reality um, that people will, will have to move. I mean, as the Prime Minister, President of Kiribati was discussing this morning, if your country is disappearing, you have to move your population. You can't sit there and wait till the water closes over your head. Uh, and similarly, there will be the same thing will arise in other places. And so therefore, we will have to think about this 
question of relocation, which raises a lot of very difficult legal questions, which we have not yet begun to address. I mean, I entirely agree with the point he's making. Yeah. Yes, Mary. Yes, if I might just comment on that. I, I had an interaction with the president of Kiribati over lunch, and I expressed uh, my worry that uh, inevitably, uh, you know, a people are going to be lost. You, you, it's, it's a loss to the world, the, the particular culture, with a particular way of thinking, a particular, and um, the, of course, what is available uh, is uh, moving in small groups into different parts of the world, the 80 to Australia, 50 to New Zealand, maybe we we'll offer 10 in Ghana, you know, and so on. But, uh, <coughs> it's, you know, it's painful. It's painful for, for a person like myself. I don't know, know about yourselves. Before our very eyes, to see some particular type of civilization sort of disappearing. And I threw out this funny idea that maybe there are countries uh, which have a lot of land. Uh, would it be possible to let uh, Kiribati move en masse? into a particular country, he said, well, we are prepared to buy. If there's an island somewhere, we could buy and relocate so we keep our culture and our tradition. And so I said, no, maybe somebody will offer. So um, for the international community, in a, <laughs> a very tongue-in-cheek man, I'm, I'm truly uh, thinking that um, for countries like this, we, we really need to think uh, more deeply. Is there no, no, but if anybody knows of an island, the president is quite willing to buy and uh, relocate uh, his population. So I, I, I want to put this on the agenda. But is this a rhetorical question? Does anyone have an answer to that? Well, they, have it, they should not give it to me, give it to the president of Kiribati. As I say, he's prepared to buy uh, to keep his people together. Well, know, I, I think there's a very interesting question that arises though. When the population of Kiribati has left, does Kiribati still exist? As a, as a state. I mean, if, if the population moved en masse somewhere else than New Zealand and lived there, yes. are they still Kiribati? I mean, they, they have an identity and a culture, but are they a state? I mean, sorry, it's a slightly rhetorical question again, but it's, it's quite an interesting one. Yes, and it could have legal implications. Mr. Mahmoud. Yeah, uh, indeed, I mean, uh, when people become environmental refugees because of the climate change, uh, for example, in case of Maldives, uh, due to the uh, sea level rise, Maldives might disappear within the next few decades. So who are responsible for this? The responsible countries, then they must have some responsibility to relocate the people of Maldives. The same for other countries, for Bangladesh. Within the next 50 years, if sea level is rising for one meter, then as I said, 30 million people of Bangladesh will be displaced, will, be, will become environmental refugees but Bangladesh is not responsible for this. Bangladesh, the responsibility of Bangladesh is 0, 0.00 something. So the most responsible countries, they must, have, they must bear some responsibility to relocate these people. But Mr. Yes. Mahmoud, do you seriously think that the US, that Europe, are going to allow so many million Bangladeshis a year to come in because they have some responsibility? I, what, I, what, is, what I would say, they do have some responsibility, but some countries are already accepting immigrants. So in accepting immigrants, there must be a component that the environmental refugees will get a priority. That can be started today. But that's only if you accept that there is such a thing as an environmental refugee, right? And John Holmes, you can tell us something about what a difficult concept that's going to be to actually, to, 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 to ratify, to, to change the wording of the treaties. 